Uh, I think uh, I have to introduce another very interesting keynote to you. Um, the topic is Evolving Family Medicine to Meet 21st Century Demands. Uh, it's by Mukesh Kavya. And uh, Dr. Mukesh is uh, an advisor uh, health, nutrition, and population at the World Bank. He is really very experienced in working with the various type of the governments all around the world. His current area of interest is helping countries get better prepared to respond effectively and immediately to outbreaks having potential pandemics. He has been an uh, an academician in Harvard University, and also he has a background of health economics from Boston University. Can I invite you to to the yes, please, an applause. And we will, we will see, is there a new role or responsibility for the family doctors? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this lovely introduction. But let me just start with some clarifications. I am not a medical doctor. I am not an expert in family medicine. I feel very humbled standing here in front of so many highly qualified people, and uh, I'm a fraud doctor, I'm a PhD in economics, which probably has no relevance or no meaning here whatsoever. But I spent a lot of time studying medicine, not as a student of medicine, but as somebody who's extremely interested in learning what this means. And I've had the privilege of working with some of the smartest people in the whole entire world. So if I say something very sensible, then it's all thanks to my mentors and my gurus sitting over here, you know, Dr. Windak, Dr. Krul, uh, Tomas Tomasek, Dr. Dudarevich, I don't know where he is, and others. And if I say something dumb, then that's because I spent time playing bridge with them and not learning what they had to say. <laughs> what I do is I now work at the World Bank. I've been there for the last several years. I stumbled into the field of health and um, I was busy sitting in a little corner doing my own econometrics and writing fancy models and imagining that one day I'll get the Nobel Prize in health because nobody has ever got a Nobel Prize in health economics. So I said, this is the field I must get into. I fancied myself as being smart and brilliant and sitting in Boston University studying with professors at MIT and Harvard. I said, this is it. This is, this is my time and this is my, my, my time to do something. I have failed miserably in that one as well. <laughs> I don't believe that there is a solution. But then I figured out something else. I figured out that health is one of those fantastic things where it is completely rational to spend as much money as you want to spend because what is more valuable is my health. Especially when I'm not well. My willingness to pay when I'm not well is extremely high. My ability to pay may be zero, but that doesn't matter. At that point of time, I'm willing to pay anything. I will cry afterwards, I will protest, I will shout, I'll throw stones. But when I am not well, I'm willing to pay everything. And that is why economics fails here. And I've learned that after 20 years of struggling to get the Nobel Prize, that this is not one that is going to happen, at least not in my lifetime. <laughs> I then changed my focus and I started working um, not so much with uh, governments in trying to figure out how to get them the right amount of fiscal space, but to start working with people. And then I stumbled onto a few absolutely serendipitous uh, happenings. Talking with uh, doctors and patients uh, in Poland, what is it that troubles them? What is it that bothers them? It's completely different. You talk to a patient, you talk to somebody in Poland where healthcare is paid for, or most of it at least is paid for. They don't care if the hospitals are 
overrunning, um, their, their, their spending, or the doctors are underpaid or overpaid. It's not their problem. When you go to, and, and I have worked in a large number of countries in Europe, in, in neighboring uh, Slovakia, I worked there for uh, several years, and um, in, uh, in, in uh, the Czech Republic, in uh, Georgia, in Romania, in Hungary, in Turkey. Oh, Turkey was my best experience. Turkey was going through an economic crisis. Mehmet Bey, you are from Turkey, so you, so you would know this, 2001. And everybody is concerned that we are spending so much money and there is no money in the system and the country is going to go broke and the government is going to go broke. And I'm walking down the street, I'm standing in front of a big hospital at Hajitepe University, a very big university in Ankara. And I'm standing there talking to a large number of patients. Not a single one is even remotely concerned or remotely bothered. These are the guys who are voting. These are the guys who are interacting with the healthcare system. What do they worry about? They worry about their interaction, the personal interaction with the healthcare system. And that is where I became a convert. So I'm, not, so I'm standing here trying to talk to you all from outside of your practice, but I think I'm a little bit more inside you than you can ever imagine because then I became a convert. Then I said, what really makes the difference in healthcare is the interaction that the patient has with the healthcare system. A good healthcare system, therefore, is one which can improve and enrich this interaction. And if we can figure that one out, we have succeeded. We heard from the previous uh, speaker, the first point of interaction is the family doctor. The first point of interaction in countries where we don't have family medicine is the GP. The first point of interaction where we have a system like that is the gatekeeper doctor. And that is what makes the difference. If we can figure that part out, it changes everything completely. A few years back, I was invited by the government of China to come and work with them on Healthy China. I spent several months there talking with um, a large number of people. And China is a big country. Each, uh, each uh, province is, is huge and has its own very, very specific issues. And I spoke with a large, large number of them. And it kept on coming down to just one thing, that patients were not happy at the point of interaction, at the point of intersection. When they walk into the health system, their unhappiness starts. Now that should be easy to fix. That doesn't need money, that just needs a smile. That doesn't need any fancy system in place, that just needs a conversation. That means that you need to talk to people as if you're part of the family, you have to be with them. And that is precisely what family medicine does. What I learned over here, working with my colleagues and friends over here, I then started implementing that in China, a country of slightly different population, around 40 million here, around 1.3 billion there. Very big country, very different uh, sets of issues. In many ways, very organized, very disciplined, great deal of money flowing in the system, both public sector, private sector. And the results were amazing. If I show you, which I will in, in a little bit, what we did there, you will laugh. You will say, really? You went there for one and a half years talking to them about this? <laughs> this is something that we knew already, and I, of course we all know it. It's just that we don't say it, and we don't say it in as many words. We talk a language that is esoteric, we talk a language that makes us look and sound very intelligent. I think if we just dumb it down a little bit, we'll probably get it right. Having said that, let me get to the focus of my talk, but before that, one more thing about the dragon. The dragon intrigued me a lot about uh, this mascot here. So I asked my team, because I had just come back from China, and in China, as you know, the dragon has a very important place. So I asked my colleagues and my team, I have a nice big research team at the bank, which is pretty well funded. And I said to them, I said, look, tell me something about the dragon. I'm writing a book on the dragon, which I'll finish five years from now. It's a huge book. 
dragons mean different things to different societies, to different countries. I could never understand why do I have a doctor who is uh, seemingly treating a dragon, when in most uh, cultures it's the other way around. The dragon is the protector. Though, of course, in Poland, the story is slightly different. Those of you who have heard about uh, the dragon here, but some other time. So you will see the dragon coming here in, in all of my slides because I'm unable to give you the story of the dragon. That will take at least uh, four or five hours, and I was told to restrict myself to 25 minutes. How do I click a page here? With this. Oh, lovely. So we are living in a fantastic world. Don't, 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 don't uh, open your um, um, news and look at CNN or look at whatever you see. We are in the best times ever. The, the world is doing extremely well at this point of time. Just to give you some examples, global poverty, which is what we work on a lot, is down phenomenally in the last 30 years. We have 9.6% people at this point of time in the world living in poverty. You worry a lot about poverty now only because of inequality. It's not because I am poor, it's because my neighbor is richer than I am, but that's a completely separate problem. Life expectancy has gone up phenomenally. In the last 50 years, we have in, our life expect, expectancy has gone up as much as it, were, it has in the last 1,000 years before that. It's huge. We are living longer and longer and longer. And people keep on telling me that that's a very serious problem because aging is a problem. Aging is not a problem at all. Aging is the only way I can get to long life, so may as well accept it. <laughs> Child mortality is falling. We have been phenomenally successful. All of you have been phenomenally successful. We use, they used the child, child mortality rates were so much higher everywhere. Now, child mortality is falling dramatically. It's in manageable, manageable, manageable levels. Literacy rates are much higher. Used to be a time when people never went to school, or they did go to school, but they dropped out, and now it is, it is phenomenally high. Still not 100%, but we are getting there, and we will get there. These, these indeed are the best times. Europe, where we are sitting here today, has a very, very special place, a very privileged place in the whole entire world. So just some statistics here. Global population, the share of global population of Europe is less than 10%. And a little over one third of the world's wealth is contained in Europe. The average incomes here are a little over three times that of the global average, so that's huge. Number of millionaires, good heavens, the high net worth individuals in Europe, 4.5 million and growing, almost 30% of the total world's millionaires are in this particular continent. A child born here is privileged. A child born here is likely to live much, much more, 10 years more than a child born in most other places in the whole entire world. We are indeed in a very, very privileged setting, and we should be very happy and grateful. Yet, our healthcare system, that is not feeling too well. Something is happening there. There is some noise in the system that is not feeling so good. People are complaining that we will shortly be spending one out of every five dollars, 20% of whatever we earn will go to health. And yes, that is going to happen. That day is not very far. It's just a matter of time, whichever way you see it. We will end up spending 20% of what we earn that will go to health. And that's one hell of a lot of money. We are living longer. The percentage of the population over 60 is going to rise phenomenally, which is fantastic. That is a testimony to how good our healthcare system is, how good we are, how happy we are, maybe. And maybe we are even, even living longer, healthier. But one thing that we cannot escape, because we are living longer, four out of every five visits to a doctor will be that by a person over the age of 65. Think what that means for your practices. 
Think how many people come to you just now at what different age groups they are. And four out of five in a few years from now will be over the age of 65. AMR, antimicrobial resistance. I've been doing a great deal of work on AMR, which is something that has affected me personally. I lost my father a couple of years back, and he was in the hospital with pneumonia. And he survived pneumonia, but he then died of a urinary tract infection, got E. coli. AMR is going to become an extremely big deal in Europe. At this point of time, it's only costing us a few billion euros. It's just a matter of time that it goes out of control if we don't do something about it now. And the answers are not easy. Europe is much ahead of the world in taking care of AMR type issues, particularly in terms of the use of antibiotics in the animal kingdom or for, uh, for, for, for uh, protein food. But it's still, still a great deal of work has to be done. And this is going to become, become one of the major, major, major problems and a major source of expenditure. At the same time, the world is changing. There's a huge, huge, huge difference in the way that the interaction with the healthcare system happens today compared to what it was happening five years back. There are huge trends which are emerging. All of you have smartphones here, I'm pretty sure. Even your patients also have smartphones. Doctors are, doctors are increasingly becoming tech savvy and patients are also increasingly becoming tech savvy. That gap that we used to speak about, that asymmetry of knowledge between the patient and the doctor is rapidly shrinking or becoming actually dangerously shrinking because the patients seem to knowing, knowing much more when they actually might not be knowing that much. So it's actually scary. The prevention, treatment, the whole way that we approach healthcare or the medicine at least is changing. Used to be that it would be on averages. If this works for 90% of the people, then this is the way to go. And that is changing to precision medicine. That's going to be a huge, huge shift. So it's no longer what the averages are because I might not be your average. But then I don't want to be your statistic either. I don't want to be the person dying because, hey, are you were out of the average. I'm so sorry, but I was right 95% of the time. That's how I was trained. Not acceptable anymore. It's getting to individual precision. Deep learning algorithms, you already have seen artificial intelligence doing all sorts of fancy stuff. It's just a matter of time when more and more and more we start relying on artificial intelligence. It's actually very scary because soon that will be the real intelligence and what is inside here will become artificial. And that's terrible. Technology-driven disease-focused care will make way to patient-centered integrated care. Gone are the days of focusing on disease that I'm taking care of tuberculosis or malaria or whatever else people take care of. But now it is about the patient, it's about the individual as the individual walks in or as the individual interacts with you. For that 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, it is that individual. That is what the demand is, demand is coming to. I will shortly show you um, uh, one slide on China and then you will laugh even more. Patients are demanding a much higher, much higher role and salience of emotional quotient or of EQ. It used to be that we would say, oh, this doctor is highly learned, went to the best of schools, has a very steady hand. This is a great guy. No, now it will be, this doctor smiles a lot, is very nice, talks, and it talks extremely nicely. That is the change that has to come. You know, my personal doctor back in Washington, D.C. is a Polish gentleman, Dr. Czarnecki. Only I can say his name, nobody else can. He calls himself Czarnecki. My wife's doctor is Dr. Klimkiewicz. He's called Dr. K. Nobody can say Klimkiewicz there. The, f the fancy things about, about both of these two doctors is the amount of time that they spend talking to us. It's a pleasure. I sit with uh, Dr. Czarnetsky for maybe 20 minutes, and 10 minutes we are talking about the weather, about golf, about baseball, about CNN, about this, about that. I try to, to talk about Poland that he doesn't know, he's from Chicago, but you know, so every time we have the same conversation. And I speak a little bit of my broken Polish to impress him, he gets very impressed, and he says, okay, how are you, by which time I've completely forgotten why I was there also, to, to even start with. 
That is the change that has to come. And that change, that solution can only come from family medicine, which is why I'm such a strong believer. And I'm so, so, so convinced that the solution, the answer is here. This is the intersection of hope and despair. And if at this intersection we don't succeed, then we can all forget about it and we can all go home with our fancy degrees. We would have failed. I see this responsibility falling on family doctors because they are the ones, you are the ones who are uniquely positioned. So the responsibility is not only yours, so the responsibility is that of the government, that of the system, that of the public, that of everybody to make sure that this interaction is the one that is strengthened, that this interface is the one that is empowered. So by yourselves, you can't do much. You can probably do one or two or three. That's not enough. You have to do it in multiple numbers. And for that multiple numbers to succeed, the system has to come behind you. That is a challenge which we posed uh, in China. I still, still uh, recall the conversation we were having with the deputy prime minister in China and trying to explain to him, this is what we want to do and this is how we want to change the notion of the delivery of health care in a country. It is not production anymore, that is different. Let's not worry about financing. I said earlier also, nobody is going to get the Nobel Prize in that. That one we have lost. What really truly matters is the delivery. And at the delivery, at that intersection, it is this group, it is this body that has to then come up not only alone, but has to come up with everybody, it has to come up with guys like us who are both inside and outside, or, or rather at the periphery, has to come from the people, has to come, come, from, come, come, from, come from the politicians. We spend a lot of time interacting with the healthcare system. I had a great deal of free time last uh, few years when I was spending a great deal of time taking care of my parents, and uh, I started started doing this study, how much time do we spend interacting with the healthcare system? And I found very, very few studies. The most detailed study is uh, the, uh, the American Time Use Survey. And I found several of those results and I started, started subscribing to them as well. And then I found a few odd ones here and there. If you, if you Google it, you will see a few blogs here and there, but those are somebody doing some fancy numbers sitting in uh, the back rooms. But how much time, how much time do we spend interacting with the healthcare system? And that starts from the time that I fall ill, I start thinking, should I go to a doctor or not go to a doctor? And I pick up the phone to make an appointment. That takes time. It's very different in countries like Poland, where I live in Washington DC, that itself is one hour gone. Getting, picking up the phone to make an appointment is one hour. I have all the fancy apps and I, and I use those fancy apps and that takes me three days to get the appointment. <laughs> Doesn't work for me. But what works for me is that I know this guy called Dr. Charnetsky so I can pick up the phone and call him and shame him into seeing me because I, I call him and I speak Polish with him and, say, and I say, Chesh, the guy is so dumb. He says, okay, please come. So that works for me. But for most people it doesn't. Assume, therefore, all the time that you spent waiting in the room outside to be seen by the doctor. Typically, you are there with somebody goes with you. You know, you have an, some attendant, you know, somebody will be there hang, you know, hanging around with you. In just outpatient care alone, and this is a study, this is based on an actual study, this is not my study, my numbers are much higher. I'm doing the study, hopefully it, it will be completed in the next few months and then I'll be able to publish it. But this is an older study and already published numbers. In the US, average time spent per outpatient visit, 275 minutes. The total time spent by the individual plus whoever is the attendant going is 275 minutes. That's a little over four and a half hours. <clears throat> so I'm spending four and a half hours for one outpatient visit. I don't know how many outpatient visits we do in a year. We say the averages are like four or five or six. Let's assume three. 
if you assume three and if you assume that you do it for 60 years for some reason then either you give up on life and you don't go to the doctor anymore or like whatever but you do it for 60 years do the math yourself you are 49,500 minutes of your life you are spending on just outpatient care assume a spread some of these numbers are inflated we don't have the actual numbers let's go with a range you are somewhere between 35 and 60,000 minutes in a lifetime with just outpatient care. Factor in inpatient. Assume that you have an inpatient episode maybe once every about 25 years or something. So you go to the hospital maybe twice or thrice or two and a half times in your entire lifetime. And add that in, factor that in. The total lifetime spent interacting with the healthcare system is about 3,000 hours. That's the amount of time that we spent interacting with the healthcare system. There have been so many studies which have been done on the workplace. Do you know how much time we spend in our entire lifetime in the workplace, assuming that we're all employed and we all work for eight hours a day and we don't take uh, you know, two long lunch breaks? We spend about 40,000 hours and this is 3,000 hours. We spent a, a lot of time and effort has gone into improving the workplace, let's make it healthy, let's make it nice, people are more productive and this. Why are we not worrying about these 3,000 hours? The reason why we should worry about the 3,000 hours is that this is the time when we are not well. The emotions going through our heads and through our hearts and the feelings that go through us are that of anxiety, we are impatient. I don't know why we call themselves patient, we are impatient. We are irritable, we are scared, we are apprehensive, we are confused, we are angry, we are hopeful, we are everything. We are just go there, you don't know what the doctor will tell you, you don't know what that wretched test will come and tell you. You are very, very scared each time you go, at least I am scared. These are the emotions that are going into your head. This is the time that you are spending. This is the time, this is the interaction where you evaluate, you assess the healthcare system. How, how much effect does this have on your psychosomatic being and how you react to that? That's a completely separate story. Question is, can I improve these 3,000 hours? Can I improve this time, this interface with the healthcare system? And my answer is, yes, we can do that. And my answer is, it is also pretty costless. I am not asking for any new money or anything, anything that has to go into it. This is exactly what we mean when we say it has to be patient-centered. The care has to focus on the individual, on the state of the mind of the individual, not on the symptom or the disease or whatever else that the individual comes to you. And if we can make that shift, and it's not a very big shift, if we can do that, I think we have reformed and we have the best healthcare system in the world. I want to digress a little bit. So, so no dragons here. I can't put a dragon in, in a study on China. It has a completely different meaning there. This is the study that we called. We, we called it the Deepening the Health Reform, Building High Quality and Value-Based Delivery. A few things about China, and then you can relate all of that to most countries in Europe. Aging population, 19 of the 20 fastest aging or 19 of the 20 oldest countries in the world are in Europe. There's only one country outside of Europe which is old, which is Japan. But 19 of the 20 countries are in Europe. Most of these countries, in most of these countries, people are growing older at higher levels of income. But within the countries, there are many people who are growing older at lower levels of income. I don't need to get into those differences. All of you know your countries quite well. I know some of these countries. And, but you can imagine this also. Growing older when you have money in your pocket is a completely different experience from gr growing older when you are not rich. Growing older, healthier is a completely different experience than growing older, not dying, but being unhealthy. That's the terrible, terrible, terrible state of affairs. 
China is going through that phase. Many countries here in Europe are going through that phase. Rising costs, all very familiar. NCDs, all very familiar. I don't know why we talk so much about NCDs. I haven't been able to figure this one out. We have to die with something, right? That is inevitable. So if it's not communicable because we have been able to fix that problem, then it has to be non-communicable. So the only reason why we talk about it is because of the peculiar nature of that interaction, because it's a repeated interaction. I keep on going back for the same thing again and again and again and again. I have been working with Tom Frieden, the former director of CDC in Atlanta during the Obama regime. And um, uh, we are shortly writing a paper, I can give you the headlines of it, that says 50 plus 30 plus zero is equal to 100. That's fancy math. Which basically says that 50% reduction in salt, 30% uh, reduction uh, in, um, 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 in, compliance, um, in compliance with uh, hypertension, and 0% trans fat. And you will save 100 million lives around the world. We are just finishing that study and we will share that also, also closely. Issues with quality, all of us are familiar with that. We all talk about quality all the time. We worry about quality, clinical quality, patient perception, whatever else. We come up with protocols every time. Somebody follows them, somebody doesn't follow them. We get impatient sometimes. If we get well, we say, great doctor. If you don't get well, we say the doctor is not following the norms. It's very, very similar issues as you can think of. So there's nothing very different um, in, this, in this particular world of China, which I found. This, so we gave them an eight-pronged strategy. The five prongs were looked at by the government of China and said, thank you very much, these are all very nice, and they were kept aside. And these are the three on which we spent the maximum time, and I'm very, very happy to tell you that these are the three which are being implemented in China. So don't laugh as I, as, I, as, I, as I read them out. First, big reform. Create a well-coordinated health service delivery system with primary care at its heart. This is kindergarten stuff. But we have forgotten this. We have all become very sophisticated and esoteric and doing sexy stuff. We have forgotten the basic thing. Enrich patient experience and quality of care. In China, we have so many instances of patients and their families beating up the doctors. Unable to express their frustration in any other way, they catch hold of the doctor right there and beat up the doctor and get away with the emotional outburst. We said, no, we need to change that and enriching patient experience. Facilitate patients' active engagement in their healthcare decisions. Gone are the days when you could tell the patient that I know what's wrong with you. You are an idiot, you have no idea. I'm telling you that you have a tummy ache. No, 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 no. I know I have a tummy ache and I understand that. I have done my Googling, I've read my internet. Explain to me a little bit more. Involve me in that decision making. Get, have that little bit, spend that little three, three minutes more. So then we did a, a post study in China. So how much time am I spending as a, as a doctor, the a primary care doctor? They still don't have the same family medicine as it is developed here in Europe. Uh, how much time am I spending with the doctor before I introduce these kinds of behavioral changes? And how much time am I spending with the patient after? And the results were amazing, amazing, amazingly interesting. The amount of time that I'm spending per visit is more, but the total amount I'm spending is less because the patient doesn't come back, the patient is so happy. The amount of time that I'm spending sitting with the patient face to face is much less than before. The patient just calls me and I answer the phone and I'm extremely happy. They use FaceTime, they use something called We. They, I also have this app called We, it's a fantastic app. So they use We, they use all sorts of different apps in talking with uh, um, um, uh, their own patients. It's just a conversation, it's a 30 second, 40 seconds conversation that gives the patient a tremendous amount of reassurance. Of course, we followed this up by changing the way that the doctors were being paid. We changed the payment of doctors, the whole paradigm from volume-based care or payments to value-based payments. We said we will not pay you on number of patients that you, that you see or the number of cases or the number of, of, of things that you do. No, no, no. 
We are going to pay you on the value of what that experience is, what that outcome is. Not easy to measure, a great deal of noise in that. And yes, the, the payments have gone up. The government is very happy, you know, wherever it has worked. Just now it's being piloted only in five uh, provinces, small provinces of you know, 10 to 15 million each, so you can imagine. And the results have been phenomenal. To my mind, this is the role, this is the responsibility, this is the reason for the existence of the family doctor. The existence, the reason why we are, we are here in this beautiful environment today, the reason is, is, is this. If not, frankly, we, we, we are losing an opportunity and so therefore it behoves on, and I keep on repeating this, not only on you, but on all of us. It behoves on the government, it behoves on the supporters, it behoves, behoves on the politicians, it behoves on the people. That what we have to do is first we have to move from volume to value. You can blame the science or you can bless the science. But dealing with patients on counts of inputs and processes must be stopped. We must stop that itemizing of a bill. In the US where I live, good Lord, if you see the bill that ever comes, you have a hospital uh, visit, you'll go crazy looking at that bill. And everything is itemized. One saline something, $567. I don't know how they come up with that number. It costs 45 cents if you buy it at CVS. But, but somehow they come up with that number. And then there's a next column which says, and insurance has paid $4.85. And they are also happy, and insurance is also happy, and, and I'm also happy. So I don't understand that. Second, we must move away from information. You know, in 1980s, the World Bank, where I worked, we were the data bank. We were the bank which collected, we were the repositories of global data. And we moved from data to information. In 1990s, we became the information bank. We were able to connect the dots. We were able to connect the data points, and we had information. So to go, to go from here to, to Warsaw, now I have two data points, and this is how you would go. In early 2000, the first decade, we moved from that, and we moved, and, and, and we became a knowledge bank. So not only would we tell you how to get from here to Warsaw, but we'll also tell you what to expect on the way. This is what will happen in the train. This is the scenery that you will see. These are the fields you'll see on this side. You'll have, you'll, all of that thing will, will, will come. In the next decade, which is the 2000, 2010 onwards, we became a solutions bank. And we started focusing on solutions. In the field of healthcare, in the field of medicine, in this interaction, we have to move from information to intelligence. Because the solution is not only in the healthcare system, the solution is to do a lot with what I do with myself as a patient, as, as a human being. You may be my best doctor in the world, but I go outside and I don't bother to look on the street where I'm crossing and I get hit by a truck and, and, and I'm dead. Or I may just go outside and I, I may just you know, uh, smoke a cigarette. After all the lecture I get from the doctor and I go and do something stupid. So, but the intelligence has to be there. So that is a change that has to happen. Third, we have to move to a healthcare system that is judged not only on how it treats patients, but also on the richness of the experience that offers. And I believe that the only interface that exists in any healthcare system in the world, that interface exists with the family doctor. To my mind, and I can't imagine what else would replace that. Yes, you could have something else like a, a, a GP. That too is fine. That is maybe your second best. But you need to have it as a family based because my illness, my experience is not an individual experience. Experience is a family experience. When I fall ill, my family starts feeling unwell. So therefore, for you to take care of me, it's not only taking care of me, it has to therefore take care of the family. So it's that kind of a thinking, that psyche is something has to change. Which is why you have the two dragons here. I still haven't figured out why we have the dragon. I missed the talk yesterday of Michael, but I'm, he was here, something about dragons in his talk. But I think the dragons must be playing some important role. But that is my big message. So 
God bless all of you. You are the hope, you are the future, and all power to you.